Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is Chapter 1, Part 3, Historical Materialism. This critical examination of Hegelianism matches in its broad outlines and its conclusions. The one which Marx, in collaboration with Engels, undertook between 1843 and 1859, and which led him to dialectical materialism. Through a lengthy inquiry into philo philosophical, or into philosophy, sorry, science and politics led Marx and Engels from jurisprudence to economics, from liberalism to socialism, and from Hegelian idealism to a highly developed form of materialism. From 1844 onwards, for practical reasons and because the Prussian state seemed to him to be oppressive for actual living men, Marx ceased to look on the state as the actuality of the ethical idea. Religion and philosophy cannot have the same content because philosophy must first of all criticize that solid pillar of institutions, established religion. Every critique must be preceded by a critique of religion. Marx was later to write that from this time onwards he had realized that juridical relations like forms of government cannot be explained either in themselves or by the supposed evolution of the human mind, but that they have the roots in the conditions of material existence which Hegel embraces as a whole under the name of civil society. From now on, therefore, Marx will develop the content of Hegelianism, the concrete theory of civil society, of the system of needs and of social relations, against Hegel's fixed system and its political consequences. The Economico-Philosophical Manuscripts, which Marx wrote in 1844, sees as essential the question, where does Hegelian logic get us? The manuscript's answer is a remarkable formula. Logic is the money of mind. Logic is only a part of the content its most elaborate, impersonal, and malleable aspect, and the one which has been most fully fashioned by intellectual exchange. Within the logical categories, there remain a few traces of the content and its movement, and abstract though these may be, we can still reconstitute the movement and recover the content. But logic is only a human value, expressed in abstract thought, its essence having become indifferent and unreal. It forms part, therefore, of the alienation of living men, because, like nature, it disregards both him and concrete existence. How can the world be, be deduced from it, and how can it be the essence of human thought? The theoretical and philosophical origins of dialectical materialism are to be found not in Hegel's logics, but in his phenomenology. For Marx, this was the key to the Hegelian system. It is here that we recover the actual content of human life, that upward movement from earth to heaven. It therefore contains the positive aspect of Hegel's idealism. Hegel resolves the world into ideas, but he is not content merely to record passively the objects of thought. He seeks to expose the act of their production. The result is that within the speculative ex exposition, he gives us a real exposition which grasps the thing itself. Here, according to the manuscripts of, 19, of 1844, Hegel considers the creation of man by himself as a process. He examines the objectification of man in a world of external objects and his de-objectification, his becoming aware of himself as a transcending of his alienation he half sees that labor is essentially a creative activity and grasps that objective man, the only real man, is the result of this creative power. According to the phenomenology, the relation of man to himself and to the human species, his realization of himself, is made possible only by the activity of the whole of humanity and presupposes the entire history of the human race. Unfortunately, the phenomenology does not properly understand man's alienation. Hegel sees an alienation in what man realizes, the world of objective products or things created by man. In the human powers and objects that have acquired an external form, wealth, the state, religion, 
which uproot man from himself by subordinating him to his own products. Hegel sees a realization of mind. In fact, Hegel replaces man by consciousness. He replaces the whole of human reality by the consciousness which knows itself. Hegel turns man into the man of consciousness instead of turning consciousness into the consciousness of real men living in the real world. Now this consciousness is nothing more than mind, metaphysically dissociated from nature, which is itself separated from man and disguised as a purely external existence. Mind, absolute knowledge, or absolute subject-object is the unity of these terms, abstract man and a nature metaphysically transposed. When Hegel studies wealth or the power of the state as essences which have become alien to human nature, he takes them only in their abstract form. They are beings of reason, alienations of pure thought. This is why the whole history of alienation and its inverse movement are nothing more than the history of the production of abstract thought, of speculative, logical thought. Quite rightly, Hegel lays stress on the split within man and on his real conflicts. But what passes in Hegel as characterizing the essence of, it, of this split, which must be abolished, is not the fact that the human essence is objectified human, inhumanly, but that it is objectified by being distinguished from abstract thought. Hegel always has in mind the abstract act of positing something, a positing a logical assertion of positing a logical assertion. He defines this act as giving a series of abstract products and then withdrawing from them. He poses the problem of the appropriation of the essential forces of man, which have become objects and alien objects. But this appropriation takes place only in man's consciousness of himself, in abstraction. In Hegel, the claiming of the objective world on behalf of man, the knowledge of the fact that religion, wealth, etc., are nothing more than the alienated reality of man, the road therefore to a truly human reality, take on a form such that sensibility, religion, and the authority of the state appear as spiritual essences. All that we find in the phenomenology, therefore, is a disguised and mystified critical analysis of these essences and moments of the mind. In actual fact, it is natural that a living, natural being should possess the objects of his desires and of his being. These objects are not his alienation. On the contrary, he is alienated by, by not possessing them. He is alienated by being temporarily dominated by a world that is other, even though he himself gave birth to it, and so equally real. In this alienation, man remains an actual living being who must overcome his alienation through objective action. The critique of the phenomenology, therefore, and of Hegel's theory of alienation, opens the way for a positive humanism, which has to transcend and unite idealism and naturalism, or materialism. The manuscript also asserts that the dialectic in Hegel between being and nothingness is suspect. Cognition establishes the nothingness of the object, which is precisely what unites the dialectical theory and the theory of alienation. The object is identical with the act of knowing. It is its alienation. The object is a mirage, a false appearance of cognition, which opposes itself and hence opposes nothingness to itself. As a relation with the object, cognition is outside itself, although it remains itself. It has been alienated. The positive theory of man it, man's alienation can but reject this dialectic between being and nothingness. In Hegel, thought purports to be the whole of life. By passing through and transcending his other being, man claims to recover himself again in pure mind. Thought recovers itself in madness, inasmuch as it is madness. The alienation, or sorry, the alienated life is recognized as the true life in religion, in the law, in political life, and finally in philosophy. To know and to live is to posit oneself, to assert oneself in contradiction to oneself, in contradiction to the knowledge and essence of the object. 
The Hegelian negation of negation is not therefore the assertion of man's true essence by the negation of his imaginary essence. On the contrary, it abolishes the concrete essence and transforms into a subject the false objectivity or abstraction, pure thought or absolute knowledge without an object. In the Hegelian transcending, the determinations that have been transcended remain as immobile moments of the total movement. Law and private property, the state, religion, etc. Their fluid essence manifests itself only philosophically. A simple thought can be overcome by pure thought. Phenomenology allows the material and sensible subtractum or substratum of the different alienated forms of consciousness to survive. It describes the relation between master and slave, but actual slavery remains and Hegel's freedom is purely mental. It describes the divided mind and expresses the spiritual malaise of the modern world, but seeks to put an end to them only in and through philosophy. Every being, every man, thus acquires a second existence, philosophical existence, which for Hegel is the only real and authentic one. Man exists philosophically. His religious or his political existence are, in actual fact, religio-philosophical, politico-philosophical, etc. Thus he is religious only insofar as he is a philosopher of religion. Hegel denies real religiousness only to immediately assert and re-establish it as an allegory of philosophical existence. Consequently, this ideal transcending leaves its object intact in reality. Hegel opposes non-philosophical immediacy, then accepts its immediate reality philosophically. The econ economico <laughs> economico philosophical manuscript rejects dialectical logic only to accept the, the theory of alienation by modifying it profoundly. This position became clearer during the years 1845 to 46 when Marx and Engels were judging the philosophy of Feuerbach against the humanism to which they had been led by their own experience and by their critique of Hegelianism. Examination of the evolution of Marxist thought does not reveal a Feuerbach phase, but rather an integration and, at the same time, a continuing critique of Feuerbach's ideas. The young left-wing Hegelians who were seeking to go beyond Hegel depended on him too directly to be able to undertake an extended critique of Hegelianism, from which they had borrowed fragments. Isolated categories, such as the consciousness of self, a pseudo-critique of religion, oh sorry, isolated categories such as the consciousness of self, for example. These young Hegelians made a pseudo-critique of religion. They wanted to give up theology while still remaining theologians and merely change the names of things and of categories, replacing Hegel's substance or subjectivity with man in general, the unique or consciousness. They took a religious view of these categories and instead of analyzing the representations of religion, canonized the world as given. Consequently, all they set out to change was consciousness by interpreting the existing world differently and thus accepting it by virtue of this fresh interpretation. Compared with Hegel, Feuerbach has little to offer. Marx was to write in 1865, yet he marked an epoch. Indeed, according to Marx and Engels, Feuerbach was the only one of the young Hegelians to have achieved anything of consequence. To the speculative raptures of Hegel, he opposed a sober philosophy by laying down the broad principles for any critique of Hegelian speculation and consequently of all metaphysics. Feuerbach's philosophy annihilated the dialectic of the concept, that war of the gods which the philosophers alone can know. Into the foreground Feuerbach put man. He criticized Hegel moreover as a Hegelian. Hegel is contradictory. If mind becomes nature and matter, then matter becomes mind. Reality and truth must be restored to nature by using Hegel's own methods. Feuerbach's great fear, Marx had already declared in the 1844 manuscript, was to have, one, proved that philosophy is only religion, logically systematized. 
It must be condemned like religion as being a form of human alienation. Hegel starts from alienation, denies it through philosophy, then reestablishes it within the speculative idea. Speculation itself must be transcended. Two, found true materialism by making man's relation to man the fundamental principle of any theory. Three, opposed to Hegel's negation of negation, which declares itself to be the absolute positive, the positive based positively on itself. Nature, the living man, material subject and object. But his doctrine is still a restricted one. He reduces man to the isolated biological and passive individual and hence still to an abstraction. Farbach's man is still only the individual member of the bourgeoisie and a typically German one at that. Farbach leaves out of account what in man is activity, community, cooperation, or relation between the individual and the human species that is practical, historical, and social man. He ignores therefore actual concrete man for the human being, man's being, is a complex of social relations. <clears throat> Farbach's humanism is therefore based on a myth, pure nature. Nature and the object seem to him to have been given for all eternity in a mysterious harmony with man which the philosopher alone can perceive. The object is posited as an object of intuition, not as a product of the activity of society or praxis. Farbach's nature is that of the virgin forest or of an atoll recently arisen in the Pacific Ocean. His materialism is therefore in one essential aspect inferior to Hegel's idealism, and the latter had started from man's activity and actually, if one-sidedly, had attempted to elucidate and elaborate this activity. Hegel saw that man is not given biologically, but produces himself in history, through life in society, that he creates himself in a process. Farbach's materialism remains one-sided and contradictory. For him, human activity, insofar as he examines it, is theoretical and abstract. Man is seen as a material object, not a sensible activity, and his sensibility does not appear as a productive potentiality. Farbach, therefore, has not broken away from that scholastic philosophy which poses the question of the existence of things and the value of thought independently of practice. In such a materialism inspired by that of the 18th century, the thought, needs, and idea, ideas of individuals are explained by education. But this explains nothing because the educators themselves need to have been educated. Farbach shows that religion is an alienation of the secular or profane world. But how has it come about that this profane world should have been thus duplicated and projected into the clouds? It must itself be divided, split, and unconscious of itself. Farbach does not explain alienation historically by starting from the life of the human species. For him, religious feeling is simply a sort of fixed and fatal error of the isolated individual, cut off from the species. He does not see it as the product of a particular social situation. His humanism is therefore restricted to the contemplation of isolated individuals in contemporary society. Now this society is itself only a form of the alienation that has got to be transcended. The world must be transformed, not merely interpreted anew. It is true that Feuerbach puts himself forward as a community man, but what practical significance can this formula have? He seeks to show that men always have need of one another. Therefore, all he wants to produce is a proper awareness of an existing fact. All he sees in the human are spontaneous and effective relationships. He never grasps the social world as the total living activity of the individuals who, comp uh, who comprise it. Farbach idealizes love and friendship as if they were improved by being religious. He locates them outside the real within the ideal and the future. He cannot rise above an abstract conception of man, of human alienation, or of the transcending of, the, of this alienation. And yet, from the fact that Feuerbach shows, or showed the world of religion to be an illusory projection of the earthly world, 
a question was posed for German philosophy which he himself did not resolve. How do men get such illusions into their heads? Even for the German theorists, this question opened the way for a materialist conception of the world. Instead of seeking to understand or construct being and beings without presuppositions, this conception observes the material presuppositions as such. For this reason, it is truly critical. <clears throat> In point of fact, real individuals, their actions and their conditions of existence, both those that they are given and those they create can be observed empirically. The mode of production of life is a mode of life of individuals. Individuals are according to how they produce their life. Consciousness does not determine life, life determines consciousness. We must start from man as both actual and active and from the actual process of living, which is continued and reproduced every day, and represent the ideological reflections and echoes of this process. If man is to attain to consciousness, at least four preconditions or presuppositions are necessary. A. Production of the means of subsistence. B. The production of fresh needs, the first one having been satisfied and its instrument acquired. This constitutes the first historical fact and separates man from animality. C. The organization of reproduction, that is, of the family. D. The cooperation of the individuals and the practical organization of social labor. Consciousness is therefore, right from the start, a product of society, and it remains so. To start with, to start with consciousness was simply animal and biological, a herd consciousness. Consequently, or subsequently, it had become real and effective, especially with the division of labor. However, the moment there is a division of labor into material and spiritual, the moment consciousness exists for itself, it is able to imagine itself as being something other than the consciousness of the existing practice, praxis. It loses sight of its own preconditions. The newborn reflection of the conscious individual breaks up the social totality at the precise moment when this totality is developing and expanding, but also when, with the division of labor, any activity is no longer anything more than a fragmentary one. Thus do ideological fantasies become possible. Moreover, the division of labor assigns production and consumption to different individuals. Division of labor and property are identical expressions. The community comes into conflict with individuals. In the end, the power proper to man becomes an alien power which opposes and subjugates him instead of being controlled by him. Each man is confined to his own sphere. He is the prisoner of his own activity, subjected to a totality he can no longer comprehend. This reification of social activity and of our product into a power which escapes from our control, which disappoints our expectations and reduces our calculations to dust, is one of the principal moments of historical development. This is the actual alienation of actual men, whose most notable forms are slavery, the class war, and the state. The state is an illusory community, but based on existing connections. It intervenes in the class war as a referee by claiming to represent the general interest, where it, where it, whereas it really represents the interests of the social group which wields the political power. The alienation of man can be transcended, but only under practical conditions. It must have grown intolerable by confronting the masses deprived of property with an existing world of wealth and culture. And this assumes a high degree of development of human potentialities. Otherwise, the abolition of alienation could only universalize privation instead of wealth, abundance, and power. The German ideology, therefore, indicates the fundamental theses of historical materialism. Set in motion by the philosophical investigation of the problem of alienation and led on by a desire to make humanism more profound and more con concrete, historical materialism integrates and transcends the philosophy of Feuerbach. It takes as its starting point the most philosophical of Hegel's theories, the theory of alienation. It integrates this theory by, by profoundly transforming it. The creation of man by himself 
is a process the human passes through and transcends moments that are inhuman, historical phases that are the other of the human. But it is practical man who creates himself in this way. By transposing it, Hegel had expressed the essence of the historical process. Feuerbach had indicated the real subject of this process, but oddly enough, only by reducing the scope and extent of Hegel's theory. Historical materialism, clearly expressed in the German ideology, achieves that unity of idealism and materialism foreshadowed and foretold in the 1844 manuscript. Once it has been formulated, historical materialism turns against the philosophy from which it had issued, against Hegelianism, against Feuerbach, against philosophy in general. The philosophical attitude is contemplative. Such an attitude is a mutilated and one-sided one, and a distant consequence of the division of labor. Now philosophy comes precisely to this conclusion, that the truth is to be found in totality. Thereby it condemns itself, since philosophy cannot be the supreme, effectual, total activity. The true, the true is the concrete. Philosophical abstractions have hardly any actual effect. There's no immobile absolute, no spiritual beyond. The propositions of the perennis philosophia are either tautologies or else acquire a definite meaning only through some historical or empirical content. To raise oneself above the world through pure reflection is, in reality, to remain imprisoned in reflection. True, concrete universality is based on the praxis. Materialism seeks to give thought back its, act its active force, the one which it had before consciousness became separated from work, when it was still linked directly with practice. The act which posited human thought and made man separate from the animals and from nature was a fully creative act, even though it has led to a split within the human reality. The total power of creation must be recovered at a higher level. Historical materialism fulfills philosophy by transcending it. It takes the supreme philosophical decision not to be misled by the illusions of successive epochs and to create a truly universal doctrine. The three requirements of philosophy, efficacy, truth, and the universality of its ideas cannot be met on the philosophical plane. Speculation must be transcended. Independent philosophy loses the medium of its existence whenever we imagine reality. In its place can come only a summary of the most general results of the study of the historical development. We must ignore philosophy and set ourselves as ordinary men to the study of the real, for which there exists an immense subject matter that the philosophers naturally know nothing of. Philosophies were ideologies, that is, transpositions of the real and effectual and one-sided theories, unaware of their own preconditions and content, always putting particular interests forward as universal ones by the use of reified abstractions. The materialist conception of history starts from the material production of immediate life and consists in developing the actual process. In seeing the basis of history to be the form of relations linked to the mode of production and created by it, Civil society in its various degrees, in expressing this form and its action as a state, in using it to explain the products and forms of consciousness, religion, philosophy, morality, etc. The environment shapes man and man shapes his environment. This sum of productive forces, capitals, and social relations, which each individual and each generation meet with as a datum, is the true substratum of what the philosophers have pictured as substance or human essence. This substratum is not in the least disturbed by the fact that the philosophers have rebelled against it as a being of consciousness or self or unique. The German ideology also contains the theory of the concrete individual whose target was Stirner's abstract individualism. For Marx and Engels, alienation, to use a term the philosophers can understand, is not a meta metaphysical notion. The alienation of man in general is only an abstraction. 
Under the name of man, the philosophers have imagined as an ideal the individual who is no longer subject to the division of labor. They have expressed they have expressed the contradiction between the actual human condition and men's needs abstractly. The historical and social process which leads from primitive animality to the era of freedom and plenty must be studied empirically. Alienation is one aspect of this process. Up till now there has been and there still is a reification of social relations with respect to individuals. Individuals alone exist. They are not uniques, the same everywhere, with rigid and necessary relations between them, but real beings at a particular stage of their development, joined to each other by relationships that are complex, concrete, and fluid. These individuals can live and develop only within the life of the human species, within the specifically human life that is, within a community. Today they must subjugate the alienated and reified powers in actual practice, so that these can be reintegrated into the community and into the lives of the individuals freely joined to that community. In particular, they must transcend the division between the purely individual life of the individual, his private life, and that part of his being which is subordinated to the life of society. to specialization, to the group of which he forms part, his class, and to the war he wages against other individuals, competition. Hitherto, in societies divided into classes, personal interests have developed, divided, or sorry, personal interests have developed in despite of persons into class interests which acquire independence vis-a-vis -vis individual persons and in their autonomy take on the form of general interests, and as such come into conflict with actual individuals. These interests seem to individuals to be superior to their own individuality, and within such a framework, personal activity can but be alienated, solidified or reified into mechanical operations external to that person. It is as if there existed within individuals a power whose relationship to them is external or contingent. A series of social forces which determine individuals, control them, and seem to them to be sacred. These are the habits and forms of behavior which the individual believes to be the most profound thing about him, and which in fact come to him from his class. Stirner did not grasp that the general interest and private interest, the historical process, and the actual alienation of the individual are two aspects of the same development. Their opposition is only momentary, relative to a particular state of society, its division into classes. One of these aspects is constantly being produced, fought against, and reproduced by the other. This phase of history has got to be transcended not in the kind of unity found in Hegel, but in the materially conditioned destruction of a historical mode of existence of individuals. The isolated individual, Stirner's unique, is an abstraction, just like man in general, but the fully developed individual in harmony with the, in harmony with the life of the free individual, fuck, in harmony with the life of the species in the specific content of human life, the free individual in a free community is not an abstraction. This concrete and complete individual is the supreme instance of thought, the final aim of man's activity. Abstract individualism leads to a paradoxical result. Selfishness, that is, in harmony with itself, transforms each man into a secret police state. The spy reflection watches over every movement of mind and body. Every action, every thought, every vital manifestation becomes a matter for reflection, that is, for the police. Selfishness that is in harmony with itself consists in the tearing asunder of man, who is divided into natural instinct and reflection, into creature and creator, in internal plebes and an internal police force. 
In this way, middle class or lower middle class selfishness interposes the mathematics of self-interest between itself and everything else, every desire and every living being. Human needs are plastic and go on multiplying, which is an essential form of progress. We live in a natural and social environment which allows us to act and satisfy ourselves multi multilaterally. It is in any case absurd to believe that an individual life can be fulfilled in the form of a single passion without satisfying the whole individual. It is just such a passion which becomes isolated and abstract in character or alienated. It manifests itself in respect of myself as an alien power. The reason for it is not in consciousness, but in being, in the vital empirical development of the individual. The individual thus mutilated develops absurdly. For example, thought becomes his passion. He becomes involved in a monotonous reflection on himself, which leads him to declare that his thought is his thought. Now, as an explanation of thought, this is untrue, but it is only too true as far as this particular individual is concerned. His thought is only his thought. In the man whose life embraces a wide circle of diverse activities and practical contacts with the world, who leads a many-sided life, thought has the same characteristic of universality as the other manifestations. Such an individual does not become fixed as abstract thought, nor does he need the complicated detours of reflection in order to get from thought to some other vital manifestation. On the other hand, with a teacher or writer whose activity is restricted on the one side to an arduous job and on the other to the pleasures of thought and whose links with the world are reduced to a minimum as a result of his wretched circumstances, it is inevitable that if he still feels the need to think, his thought should become an should become as abstract as himself and his life. It will become an unvarying force which, once set in motion, makes it possible for him to enjoy a fleeting pleasure and salvation. The alienation, or to be more precise, the reification of man's activities is therefore a social fact, and also an infernal fact, exactly contemporaneous with the formation of the inner or private life of the individual. A psychosociology of alienation is possible. We are alienated individuals. All our desires are by nature brutal, one-sided, and erratic. They arise haphazardly and frequently and only when stimulated by some elementary physiological need. And they are brutal in their externalization, repressing other desires and dominating thought itself. The individual may even take a mutilated, one-sided form of activity as his vocation and so be completely led astray and despoiled. Both within and around him, the contingent is in control. He is a victim of circumstances. Hitherto, freedom has meant simply the opportunity of profiting from chance. Although certain individuals may see it as a vocation or moral obligation to take action against this state of affairs, such action cannot be purely moral. We have got to achieve a new stage of civilization and culture and enable man to realize his potentialities by altering the conditions of, exist of his existence. What is needed is a new creation of power. Stirner's moral revolt against the existing order, against the social and the sacred in all its forms, is nothing but the canonization of the vague discontent of the lower middle classes. Only the modern proletariat, which experiences privation, alienation, and reification to the full, can will the transcendence of alienation practically, i.e. on the plane of the social praxis or politically. The meaning of life lies in the full development of human possibilities, which are constricted and paralyzed not by nature, but by the contradictory class nature of social relations.